Now, in uh, our research, um, we are interested in understanding how cell signaling uh, works, not necessarily uh, only from a molecular perspective, uh, but also understanding a bit like what are the structural um, or physical aspects that, that play a role uh, in there. Uh, and so my talk will be about uncovering cell signaling, um, the initiation, uh, and using uh, multiparametric image spectroscopy um, to do so. Now, in particular, um, the, the um, signaling uh, that we are interested in uh, is one that is initiated uh, by C95. So the cluster of differentiation 95 is a receptor um, which usually uh, is activated if a ligand uh, couples to it. So then it can uh, switch from an inactive into an active state. Uh, to some extent, it will also oligomerize and then it can recruit so-called adapter proteins, uh, which then in turn uh, recruit so-called caspases. And these caspases, um, when they get active, they, they can act like uh, scissors uh, and cleave proteins uh, that eventually lead to a controlled form of cell death, uh, which is termed uh, apoptosis. And I hope that most of you um, are also a bit uh, familiar with how, how signaling uh, works uh, in cells. So um, what we would like to uh, understand is now um, how does the oligomerization uh, at the level of the plasma membrane eventually affect uh, the cell response. So um, one has uh, seen that different ways of activation can also uh, trigger different um, signaling, like the intensity of the signaling, for example, and we wanted to, to understand uh, this further. Now, the C95 uh, signaling uh, in particular uh, is especially interesting uh, because uh, this receptor is only activated by a single ligand, a C95 um, ligand. And therefore, um, one has yeah, a very unique way uh, of triggering this uh, signaling pathway. And therefore, it's also interesting uh, from a medical point of view. So uh, apoptosis in general um, is uh, important also uh, because it has implications um, for developmental uh, aspects. So for example, um, for the sculpting of organs uh, during embryogenesis, uh, you need a controlled form of cell death, uh, for example, for the um, formation of, uh, of your digits. Then of course, every day uh, in your body, all cells divide and at the same time, um, the cells have to die uh, so that you don't grow um, endlessly, but, but the cell numbers uh, are kept constant uh, every day. Then another aspect of why apoptosis is interesting is, of course, to eliminate malignant cells uh, so that cells undergo this controlled form of death uh, so they don't uh, expose, for example, any uh, intracellular uh, harmful parts uh, to the surrounding cells, um, but to undergo uh, this form of uh, cell death in a controlled manner. So what we would like to understand is um, what are the molecular uh, mechanisms on the level of the uh, receptor that initiates the signaling pathway um, to the uh, eventual, which eventually leads then to cell death. So the question uh, that we ask in particular are, um, there are several models and they all propose uh, that this uh, receptor is oligomerizing. And we were wondering um, how can we scrutinize these different models that exist. So two of the most favorite models um, are the ones that either um, propose a receptor that is activated by the ligand, and then there is some form of oligomerization up to a so-called trimer, trimer configuration. So the ligand always appears in a trimeric form uh, and then receptors can bind to it. So then you have these signaling hubs consisting of trimer trimers, uh, that eventually then um, lead to this apoptosis um, of the cell. But there's also another uh, quite popular model uh, that suggests that you have hexagonal structures that um, are priori form on the surface of the cell uh, with diameters of about 20 nanometers. Um, and these hexagonal networks then um, lead to intracellular cross-linking by adapter proteins, for example. Um, and um, that uh, these highly yeah, complex and, and, and very unique structures are necessary uh, to trigger uh, this type of uh, signaling, which yeah, eventually leads 
uh, to cell death. So it, uh, you must have a robust mechanism and this robustness is uh, conferred um, uh, or delivered by this, this network. So how can you scrutinize uh, these models? Because you need to have techniques that allow you to distinguish uh, structures that appear uh, on nanometric scales. And um, for this, um, we first developed uh, a small library of, uh, of different molecules that allow us uh, to yeah, allow changes uh, within the signaling pathway. And for this, it's uh, good to look how the receptor looks like. Um, so first of all, the, the receptor consists of three so-called cysteine-rich domains on the extracellular side. Um, there is the so-called pre-ligand assembly domain, the PLAT domain, um, that allows for interaction um, when the receptor uh, has no ligand bound. And then once the ligand uh, is bound, the ligand will uh, interact with the receptor via amino acid 102. Then uh, in this active state, um, you have the so-called death domain, uh, which unfolds. Um, and uh, then via this death domain, uh, after the unfolding, the adapter molecules can be recruited. So what we did is um, we adjusted by a linker, a GFP, um, to not, um, yeah, not um, inhibit the function of the receptor. Um, and um, we also modified uh, the receptor to the following uh, extent. So first of all, um, what we did is we created um, a cell line that does not produce any CD95. Um, and then we had uh, 13 plasmids uh, that, uh, that we generated. So the CD95 uh, receptor with this, with this GFP, as you can see down here in the sketch. And we will um, see that in case of so-called FRET measurements, I will explain a little bit what FRET is in case you are not familiar with this technique. Um, you always need um, a receptor with um, a green and one with a uh, more, more orange uh, um, or red color. Uh, so two different fluorophores. And in this case, we created a plasmid um, that twice produces the CD95, one with a GFP, one, one with an M-cherry. Um, and, uh, and then this is here uh, cut in the middle. Uh, and then you have an equal amount uh, of the green uh, and, of, and of the red labeled the CD95. Then um, in addition, we also created uh, a delta death uh, domain CD95. So this is a receptor which cannot transfer um, or transduce the signal any further. And therefore it allows us to, to look at what the receptor does um, without the cells, uh, yeah, without cells dying over time. So that's also a very, very good uh, control. Then we had uh, another construct uh, with CD95 without the delta plot domain. Uh, and uh, another one that cannot find the ligand. Um, so also some, some controls. Then there are two very interesting controls. And uh, when you want to do single molecule experiments, uh, I can just recommend to, to develop such uh, controls. The one is a so-called monomeric control. So there is a receptor called CD86, um, which has been reported to be a monomer. And we also could verify very nicely, as we will see, that it is indeed a monomer, so it will not oligomerize at all. Uh, and this is very important if you want to do quantitative benchmarking. And then the other one is a dimeric control. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, CTLA4 is a molecule that has always been reported to form a dimer. Um, and we found out that it's not always a dimer. Um, and because it's not always a dimer, we created a so-called pseudodimer which means we just took the monomer control and added two GFP, uh, one after the other, um, to the intracellular site to have a so-called pseudodime. Now, in order to understand signaling, uh, we have to understand that, first of all, signaling is dynamic, certainly. So you need uh, to not only look at one particular time point, but you have to uh, look at how signaling evolves over time. Signal initiation may also be very local. So you must not only focus on one area of the cell, but you have to scan the whole cell. And signaling also depends on molecular concentration. And for this reason, um, it's often not sufficient to just use a single technique. And here we 
combined several techniques, as you see, um, and covering the whole range of the solutions, uh, resolution uh, from the cellular level up to the single molecule uh, level uh, to then uh, infer a model of how the signal initiation uh, indeed works. And we started off with just a regular um, time-lapse mapping of, of how cells are dying um, and to just learn a bit about uh, how long does it take for this uh, signal initiation to take place and to eventually then lead to cellular death. Um, and what we could see uh, is that uh, here uh, in this graph, um, the time trace is, is shown on the x-axis and on the y-axis the percentage of death. Uh, cells, um, and we could see that first of all, it takes uh, a couple of hours. So after usually about two to three hours uh, in most of the cells, this, the signal had been initiated. Uh, and then um, we saw also strong ligand uh, dependency um, in terms of the percentage of cells that eventually um, undergo apoptosis. So we have a sensitive response with regard to uh, ligand concentrations. Um, and we fitted um, these. Um, yeah, curves with a so-called Hill uh, equation uh, to extract some parameters such as the maximum amount of the death cells and the half times um, for quantitative comparison. We also looked at uh, different uh, cell uh, lines which uh, have a different amount of, of this receptor. So for example, um, HeLa, uh, the, the knockout cell lines are our controls. They don't have any. The CD95, this is the line that you see here um, at the bottom, so they don't die at all, uh, whereas uh, cells um, which, which overexpress, so the stable uh, cell lines, they produce a lot of CD95, uh, they die very quickly. So you can overall see that the more ligands and the more receptors you have, of course, the faster uh, the death is. Um, and from the um, parameters that we extracted uh, from the HILFIT, you could see that uh, the maximum apoptosis fraction scales with the concentration of the ligand and the concentration uh, of the receptor, uh, so uh, it increases. Uh, and also the kinetics, so the um, signaling kinetics strongly depends uh, on the ligand, so the more ligand we provide, the faster uh, the apoptosis is. But usually um, two hours is a, is a good way uh, if you uh, want to look um, at a cell uh, signal initiation, and after two hours, uh, it appeared uh, to be a good uh, time point to look very closely uh, on a single molecule scale uh, to what's, uh, what's going on with C95. Now, um, when we wanted to peer more deeply uh, into um, the structure and to probe this, uh, this model of the hexagonal networks, um, we wanted to use uh, stimulated emission depletion uh, as a technique to um, have a better resolution. So as a reminder, um, with that, you overlay two lasers, uh, the normal uh, diffraction limited laser beam with a so-called donut shaped stat laser. Um, this uh, stat laser uh, allows to deplete uh, all fluor force, um, which are uh, or most of the fluor force in the outer ring. Uh, and then you only are left with the fluorescence of this of the central uh, part here. And this gave us an effective a resolution of about uh, 40 nanometer. So we could have a 40 nanometer. Um, this is, corresponds to this orange spot uh, that you see up here. So um, if we have large networks, which are larger than a hexagon, we would be able to resolve it. And um, this is what, what we did to first see, do we have these large hexagons? Um, and for this reason, um, we labeled uh, our receptor with a, with a dye that um, can be used for STAT. Um, and we did some image uh, analysis uh, and um, interestingly found, first of all, um, that we mostly have diffraction uh, limited spots um, and um, the spot size uh, distribution that you can see here in this histogram was more or less equal um, for the control and the CD95 sample. So uh, we did not really observe these large hexagons. Uh, this was the one um, result. And the other result was um, to look at whether these spots are um, randomly distributed. Uh, and for this reason, 
um, we were uh, calculating the so-called pair correlation function, also showing us uh, that we had uh, a random distribution of spots. Now then, uh, because we could not see any hexagonal uh, networks, at least no, no large networks, we were wondering maybe we can infer something from the brightness of each spot. So if, for example, we see some very bright spots, then maybe there is one hexagonal hidden within this um, PSF. And uh, for this uh, reason, um, we looked at the brightness, um, so the photons uh, per pixel, and interestingly, what, what we found here is, so if you have C95 or C95 with the ligand, you can see a shift um, of the uh, average uh, brightness. So there seems to be something happening once the ligand is added uh, that you have brighter spots. Uh, interestingly, when you do the same for the receptor that does not transduce um, the signal further, you can see a very similar behavior. Uh, so also here, once the ligand is there, uh, there seems to be some, some recruitment of receptors and accumulation of receptors going on. Uh, that's why the average brightness uh, rises. Um, and then um, what was very uh, good was to compare this to our monomer and dimer controls. Uh, and from the monomer and dimer controls, you could see that without any ligand, uh, we have a signal that is very similar to the monomer control, um, whereas if the ligand is added, um, we are getting close to, to the dimer control. And this was a first indication um, that we don't really get very large uh, structures, maybe not even uh, a hexagon. So in order to now peer more into what's going on within such a, a stat spot, um, you have to learn something about the stoichiometry. Um, you have to, for example, count the number of receptors which are in such a spot. Um, and in order to do this, um, we perform photobleaching step uh, analysis. And photobleaching step analysis, what you do is um, you record um, the membrane surface and you have fluorescent spots, and then uh, you just bleach uh, each spot. And then uh, from the bleaching uh, trace, uh, you can see that there is a decrease in the brightness uh, whenever one GFP, for example, uh, is bleached. And then you can uh, fit uh, these steps uh, with an uh, algorithm. The colorful Fisher algorithm is commonly used uh, for that. Um, and we also extended um, this um, yeah, traditional um, photobleaching step analysis uh, to, to be used uh, for a confocal microscope. Um, and um, also with um, EGFP uh, bleaching. Uh, steps. Uh, so we here combined um, a stationary confocal spot uh, with time correlated readout to, uh, to bleach these individual spots uh, and then infer from the number of steps that we see uh, how many of the GFP or how many of the receptors would be uh, within one spot. And what we then um, observed, so we call this confocal uh, PBSA, and what we then observed um, was that indeed. For the monomeric control, we mostly get uh, only a single uh, step. Uh, the same was for the CD95 without any ligand. Um, but then um, if you have also a ligand, um, you get uh, also more um, events of two steps or three steps. Uh, and for the dimer control, um, it was the same. You get more uh, of, of two steps and three steps. Of course, mostly you would expect two steps uh, for the dimer control. But interestingly, of course, um, you also see three steps or more than three steps. And the question is, why is that the case? In an ideal sample, you would just expect a single step or two steps. And um, what we can learn from this experiment is that you have concentration fluctuations over the, uh, over the surface. So of course, the receptors are randomly distributed. And because of concentration fluctuations, you don't just have a single step or just two steps. Um, because there is an oligomer, but you can also sometimes have three steps because just by chance uh, there are more than um, two um, molecules uh, in the spot, uh, even if it's uh, just, a, just a dime. But uh, looking at the, the average step number again, 
um, we could confirm our result from STAT that the monomer um, uh, gives a signal which is similar to C95 uh, without the ligand. Once the ligand is added, we get more steps, uh, but the number of steps is still less than the dimer controls. So this was a strong indication um, that the CD95 without the ligand is always monomeric. And then once the ligand is added, um, we do get a bit of oligomerization, but it's not much more uh, than, than um, what you what you would have if you would have a hexagon. So then We're nearly the about final, five minutes left. Yeah, I'm fine. So that's uh, the final technique that, that we then used. We wanted to exactly determine now if we just have only small uh, oligomers, um, what exactly do we have? Do we have trimers? Do we have um, maybe five mers or so? And for this, we used um, FRET. And in FRET, um, as I initially um, announced, uh, we have like two fluorophores, a donor and an acceptor fluorophore. Um, and uh, what happens is when they come close to each other, then the fluorescence of the so-called donor uh, fluorophore goes down. So there's a reduced form of emission. Um, and this is exactly uh, what we are looking at. So you have a pair of fluorophores. They, their spectra need to overlap. So this so-called energy transfer can take place. So energy from the donor is given to, to the acceptor. Uh, and, and as a consequence, um, the emission and the fluorescence goes down. And you can see this when this happens uh, in a reduction of the lifetime uh, of the fluorescence of the donor. So if there is the so-called energy transfer, then the lifetime of the donor is reduced. And you can calculate uh, from this so-called a FRET efficiency. Um, so the lifetime when there is FRET uh, will be shorter than the lifetime when the donor is alone. Uh, and this gives you a FRET efficiency. Uh, and this scales with the distance uh, of these two flow force from each other. Um, very sensitively, as you can see here. Uh, so only um, within 10 nanometer distance, um, you can get this FRET uh, transfer. Uh, and you can nicely say, are these molecules two, three, or four, or five uh, nanometers away from each other? So we use this technique um, to uh, look at uh, our, our samples. And what was very interesting, um, by cal calculating the fraction of, of flu force that undergo FRET uh, as a function of the concentration of these molecules on the surface, we could see, first of all, CD86 is always a monomer. There is no FRET. There is no FRET up to a certain concentration threshold. And this concentration threshold is a threshold when you have just so many receptors on the surface of the membrane um, that they are just by chance close to each other and therefore undergo FRET. So here's the so-called proximity effect that takes place. Uh, and you know that um, you have a concentration and effect and that gives rise to proximity FRET. So for FRET, it's always good to know where is this threshold so that you don't misinterpret um, an oligomer where there is no uh, oligomer um, when you are in this regime. So you have to stick to the regime where you only see monomers. And then for CTLA4, uh, we saw that it's not um, um, a dimer. It's only a dimer in the high concentration regime, whereas in the low concentration regime, uh, it's a monomer. Now we then performed the same for CD95. Um, and as you can see here, CD95 without ligand is also again a monomer. Um, you get proximity FRET effects. When you add the ligand, you get a bit of FRET, but the absolute amplitude is, is quite low, lower than CTLI4. And exactly the same pattern was observed also for the CD95 with the death domain, showing us um, that we only get dimers or trimers. Um, of C95 that oligomers. So we have um, the uh, oligomerization to just uh, small, small dimers and trimers that, that, that we get. We um, also determined the, the overall fraction. So we could um, switch um, the FRET fraction into the percentage of oligomers. And when you look here at these graphs, you can see 
that there are only about uh, 10 to 15 percent uh, of receptors on the uh, on the cellular surface that actually uh, form oligomers. So you only um, have um, about uh, 10 percent of receptors that have to oligomerize to trigger the signal. So we can see that um, or we derived a quantification of CU95 oligomerization over time. Um, and eventually we could uh, confirm that um, we have a model of signal initiation, which relies on the monomer uh, C95 that only oligomerizes to dimers and trimers. Um, and there are only 10% of these oligomers needed to have an effective induction of the apoptosis signal. So this is a minimal model. So it's like the minimal amount of um, yeah, molecular oligomerization uh, that you need to have an effective signal um, induction. And this was uh, the result of this um, study. So, and we also have a method, methodological uh, development. Um, so you saw you have, we have nice monomer and dimer controls. Um, and you could also find that CTLA4 is not always a uh, dimer, which was very interesting. Um, yeah, and, and uh, eventually derived this model. So with this, uh, I'd like to um, yeah, acknowledge uh, the team members, especially Nina and Nicolas, uh, who did uh, this work. She's my first PhD student uh, and has really done an excellent job together with Nicolas, um, the people who fund our research and uh, I thank you uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you very much for that great talk, Cornelia. Um, we have a couple minutes for questions. I can um, there's I can start this off. I have one in the chat, but I'll ask a different one. Um, which is what is the the threshold for calling um, a cell um, apoptotic? So like when when you're looking at it, you get some signal. When do you decide that it's actually going through apoptosis? So this we we always uh, do by um, by just a live cell uh, mic microscopy. So if you can see in the phase contrast or bright field mode uh, that it forms black blaps, then this is the moment when we call it apoptotic. Yeah, um, there are of course also um, markers um, like caspase uh, activity markers that that um, that give a fluorescence uh, signal that you can use. Um, but we usually stuck to like the final stage uh, when you can by eye already see that the cell is dead. Okay. Um, and I'll ask one more question. Um, I think we have about one more minute. Um, do, these, do these ligands in the surface of the cell, are they moving around? Do they diffuse? And does it matter where they are in the cell? Um, they do diffuse. So we, we did FCS measurements uh, as well. So this is a, a method. Um, that's used to, to measure the um, diffusion constant. Uh, we could see that they are mobile. Um, we could not see actually any, any difference in, in, in diffusion. Um, and um, we also tried to look whether they localize to lipid rafts. Um, this, this staining was a bit difficult, so we could not really uh, say where in the membrane they are located. Um, but uh, we could verify that they are uh, mobile and uh, the mobility is not inhibited.